Welcome, everybody. I see many of you signing on. Everybody's going to enjoy lunch together or some earlier part of the day. Uh, today's topic is aging is mandatory, arthritic pain is optional. Our presenter today is Dr. Gary Oswald, DVM, DACVIM, that would be internal medicine. He established Tampa Bay Veterinary Specialist and Emergency Care Center in Clearwater, Florida and served as a staff internist and medical director. Dr. Oswald is the author of numerous published case reports and medical articles and is a frequently requested continuing education presenter in the United States and abroad. We welcome Dr. Oswald. Well, hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you guys are all in. Uh, thank you very much for joining in with us today. Um, as uh, Carolyn said, I'm Dr. Gary Oswald, uh, coming to you today from uh, Clearwater, Florida, kind of a rainy overcast Clearwater, Florida today. Um, we're going to talk about osteoarthritis and geriatric dogs and cats today. Most of my background in internal medicine has been involved uh, primarily in, in kidneys and urinary tract issues. And aging and, and the urinary system or the kidneys certainly go well together. And we want to talk a little bit about how we try to manage osteoarthritis in, in patients that we oftentimes know uh, maybe don't have the best uh, supportive systems, especially their kidneys. From a financial disclosure, I'm a consultant for both the CC Animal Health and for PRN PharmaCal, which you'll see some information from both companies in today's talk. So what we wanna talk about a little bit is recognizing early on, if we can, clinical signs of osteoarthritis. When you have a bad hip, as you see here uh, in this poor cat, actually, compared to a very normal hip over on the other side, uh, it's pretty obvious that most clients can pick up uh, osteoarthritis signs when an animal is overtly lame, when they're not using one leg well and there's an obvious disruption of its function. But I want you to think about lots of other things that may be tipping the scale for you to think about arthritis in older pets, just general stiffness in their legs, uh, reluctance or hesitance to jump up and down on the surfaces they normally will. I've got an older cat and we're finding now that he loves to jump up uh, to the sinks for water. And over the last few months, it's been more difficult for him. Again, probably a good sign of osteoarthritis. Uh, patients that have difficulty going up and down stairs, if you have those at home, especially in dogs. Uh, cats, difficulty getting over the lip of the litter box, sometimes urinating or defecating outside the box because it's painful for them to get their body up and over that lid. We also think of reduced activity as a sign of osteoarthritis. Uh, some of our patients just spend more time resting, taking a general walk or doing things that once were easy, just wears them out. Uh, maybe sleeping in places that are easier to assess. You know, many times our dogs and cats over the years sleep on beds or cats in elevated positions. If you find that suddenly they're not taking the effort to get to those places, it very easily could be a sign of arthritis. Uh, and just general reduced interaction with, with normal people or other animals in the household. Uh, altered grooming, uh, we see this in both dogs and cats where they either um, reduce the amount of grooming they do in some cases because it hurts to get their limbs into positions where they can groom effectively. Or in other cases, they may actually over groom dogs and cats where they spend a particular amount of time over a carpus or wrist joint or over the knee joint. Uh, and sometimes you'll see hair loss in those areas or shortened hair from, from them licking at those areas because they, their discomfort. Uh, overgrown toenails on one leg versus the other three can be seen because pets that have arthritis don't place maximal weight on those limbs. And then lastly, you see down here Grumpy Cat, and I'm sure many of you recognize her. She, she passed away late last year, unfortunately, and this is now the replacement Grumpy Dog. But temperament changes, uh, these patients that are irritable, they're grumpy when they're handled. You know, they actually avoid interaction with you because they don't want to be petted or picked up or so forth. So lots of different signs that are not just overt lameness that you need to look for to pick up that your pet has arthritis. So today we've got a number of things we want to talk about as far as treating osteoarthritis. We'll spend a little bit of time on drugs that reduce inflammation and reduce pain. We'll talk a little bit about chondral protectants. But then I also want to spend a lot of time on ancillary treatments and devices 
And then some other simple things uh, like exercise, modifying the environment, weight loss that all play big roles in helping our geriatric pets specifically in hopefully living a better quality of life. So when you go into the veterinarian's office, uh, I think for most of us, most veterinarians first thought with osteoarthritis, once a client recognizes those signs a physical exam supports pain in certain joints or specific areas, maybe x-rays confirm osteoarthritis, there's a variety of drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs that are very similar to what we as people would take. But again, if from an animal perspective, from a client perspective, we really want to avoid home administration of things that we would take like aspirin, acetaminophen especially, ibuprofen, naproxen, all common human antiarthritic medications, but there are much better and much safer medications. You should always consult with your veterinarian about what to give your pets. But in most cases, we're gonna end up going to see the veterinarian and end up on some anti-inflammatory pharmaceutical. Now, there are a couple of different drugs we would look at. I don't have any real preferences, to be honest with you. It's whichever drug helps your pet be more comfortable. And if one doesn't work, make sure you tell the veterinarian that because another type of drug, when you look at all of these ones we have available, all of them somewhat interact a little bit differently with individual patients, just like one person might do better on ibuprofen, another might do better on naproxen. So these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, we call those, very commonly used in dogs. Uh, currently in the United States, they're still off-label for use in cats, but they are commonly used. And we have some concerns about using NSAIDs, especially as patients get older. This geriatric population, as I've mentioned previously, has a definite drug interaction effect with kidney function. Many times these sort of drugs can cause gastrointestinal disturbances and even blood clotting disorders. Uh, and cats in particular with arthritis or cats just in general uh, have issues with their liver where their metabolism is different. And many times they cannot break down these drugs properly. So we do have to be careful. All we should be consulting with your veterinarian and getting their recommendations on appropriate use of non-steroidals. Now we'll contrast that to glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids are actually steroid anti-inflammatories. You would know probably the name prednisone. Um, these are drugs that are definitely not recommended for long-term use for osteoarthritic patients. They are catabolic drugs, meaning they break down body tissues over time. They tend to have patients gain weight and both of those things, breaking down muscle and gaining weight over time would be detrimental to an arthritic patient. So definitely something we don't want to do. When it comes to cats in particular, I'll just share two slides with you. Uh, I said that again, they're not, uh, these drugs are not approved for use in cats in the United States. In almost every other country, in Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, these two products I'll show you are okay for cats, but they're given at a lower dose than dogs. Uh, Meloxicam is one drug, it does come in a generic and a brand name Medicam. Uh, real careful, if you have any dog or cat on these sort of NSAIDs, be sure they're always eating and drinking well. If they're not eating and drinking or getting dehydrated for some reason, we want to temporarily discontinue as that's unfortunately a way that we can really upset the kidneys if those drugs are continued. Uh, there's another drug called Onsior is the trade name or Robenicoxib. It is again also licensed for use in dogs and cats for arthritis in Europe not yet for cats in the US, but again, it's used quite commonly on um, the same sort of uh, situations. Now, when it comes to these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that are used commonly, initial use, just like in us, should be as needed. Just because you're painful one day and you take a drug, you might get relief for days before your arthritis flares up again. So let's be careful to not become dependent on using these sort of drugs in our pets every day. Watch them carefully. If they're comfortable, then again, we only use these as needed. When a patient's arthritis progresses and they get worse, however, you may find that these drugs do need to be used daily. And in that case, there are other drugs or modalities that we should maybe consider to use so that we don't become reliant only on these type of drugs. Now, in addition to non-steroidals, there's another class of drugs that block the pain response. They don't really do anything to reduce 
osteoarthritic inflammation, but some are narcotics and some are non-narcotic drugs that can help block pain. As you can see, this kitty cat here has me and Al, and so he needs something to block his pain response. A common drug you might get prescribed, excuse me for a minute, I'll turn my phone off. A common drug you may see prescribed for arthritis, again, at your veterinary office is gabapentin. It's become quite a popular drug in dogs specifically, and occasionally in cats in the last uh, five to 10 years. It treats neuropathic pain. So again, it tries to deaden some of the nerves that uh, you know, cause the pain response. And it can be combined very well uh, with the use of the other drugs we mentioned like NSAIDs. Uh, sedation is a limiting effect. Uh, if you take too much, you'll sleep all day. And it is a predominantly, this drug is cleared by the kidney. So again, your veterinarian has to be careful in the use in geriatric patients but it can be a very effective drug in combination to help relieve pain. Uh, one thing we wanna be aware of in dogs is there is a commercial solution for people. That solution contains xylitol. Xylitol is an additive that we use many times for baking, for sweetness and cookies and cakes. And again, it can be very toxic to dogs' livers. So we always wanna be sure that we do not obtain xylitol uh, containing gabapentin. Tramadol is another very popular drug in veterinary medicine is prescribed all the time. I tend not to use much tramadol and I'll tell you why. It works well in cats, but cats hate this drug. It tastes terrible. It causes them many times to hallucinate and many times they don't eat or get constipated. So it's not a great drug for cats from a side effect component. And in dogs, the reason I tend not to use it and, and still many, many vets do, but research in the last couple of years has been very definitive that this drug just simply doesn't work very well in relieving pain for dogs. Uh, so again, it would be a drug that, uh, you know, sometimes people say, yeah, I do see an, an ability for that to help. I think a lot of that in dogs is a placebo effect. Tramadol would be something I would be unlikely to use. Lastly, a narcotic drug that can be used in advanced arthritis is buprenorphine. It's a narcotic, it can be given, although it's an injectable drug, it can be given into the mouth on the gums and uh, we'll get a little bit of a narcotic pain relief that will hopefully help patients do better. Again, a drug that's usually used more in advanced osteoarthritis in combination with NSAIDs. So those are all fine and good. One drug that you may also find, narcotic drug, codeine, that has acetaminophen, it's prescribed widely for people. Don't use it in dogs and cats, especially cats. Acetaminophen is highly toxic in them. So if you happen to have this drug in your household for you or a family member, it should never be shared with, uh, with our veterinary patients. So that's good and fine. We have these NSAIDs and we have these narcotic and narcotic-like drugs that can help our patients. And again, they are good drugs. They need to be regulated carefully in older patients because again, a lot of our older dogs and cats uh, develop under the current. We don't see it, but they're developing kidney dysfunction as they age. And those type of drugs can definitely have an impact on that. One of the big things we try to do in, in internal medicine is we try to spare the kidneys or we call it spare the nephron. We want kidneys to continue to function into advanced age. And again, sometimes other body systems like arthritis and drugs can, can be detrimental to our kidneys. So what can we do outside of drugs to spare the kidneys in these older patients? So as you see this cat taking a selfie here, He's screaming out, no more drugs, please. It's hard enough already to give cats drugs. There's uh, dogs, it's a lot easier to give them things, but cats oftentimes, when we try to give them multiple drugs like NSAIDs and narcotics, it really affects their behaviors, their appetite. They oftentimes just don't handle drugs as well. So again, what can we do outside of drugs or in complement to maybe using less drugs to help arthritic patients? So the first thing that people always think about is what about glucosamine chondroitin? Uh, this is a chondro protectant. It's a supplement, it's not a drug. It does improve joint fluid characteristics, but the bottom line is for this type of drug to work, you still have to have a lot of cartilage in your, in your uh, joints. And in many more advanced patients, they've already crossed a line where these type of supplements just simply don't provide much in the way of improving their joints any longer. This is the reason why you want to pick up on arthritis early on so that you can hopefully use these sort of supplements early in arthritic patients when they still have a lot of active cartilage. It hasn't eroded away. And then it certainly might be beneficial on a daily basis. 
these drugs or these supplements are safe, they don't interact with your kidneys, and they certainly work well. Now, other drugs and nutraceuticals, we'll say nutraceuticals meaning again, more natural supplements that can be used to reduce pain would be things like omega-3 fatty acids, so fish oils, and a substance called microlactin. So if you look at these, omega-3 fatty acids do provide anti-inflammatory activity. They reduce joint inflammation that's associated with osteoarthritis. They also improve the kidneys. So this is a nice supplement that almost every arthritic older patient should be on, or it should be supplemented in their diets if they're taking a prescription diet. Many of those are already supplemented with omega-3 fatty acids. Microlactin is a product that's made from concentrated milk protein from cows that are hyperimmunized. So they have a very active immune system. And this supplement actually is very interesting and it basically reduces local inflammation, but in an independent way that you don't see with steroids or the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So as such, it can relieve pain and inflammation, yet it's very safe on the intestinal tract, the kidneys, and so on. And in fact, there are products made such as Duralactin, which uh, is microlactin, and uh, you can also get it combined with omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, oftentimes you'll see effects when you use a supplement like this of benefit within a week and hopefully maximal effects within a two week period. Other things that we can do that are not necessarily gonna go in your mouth, these are al alternative therapies that also will hopefully provide pain and inflammation relief for arthritic patients would be things like pulsed electronomagnetic field therapy. A uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon that goes on. We've known for over 100 years that the combination of electricity and magnetic fields can change uh, the cells in the body. And if you have a field, as you see in this picture here, coming off of this magnetic loop, it's going to do some things to the tissues that are in proximity to it that hopefully affect their metabolism, reduce the inflammation or pain in that region, uh, actually repair and promote tissue growth. So there's definitely uh, interesting uh, phenomenons that occur when you use pulse electronic magnetic fields. And there's numerous studies in human medicine going back decades and some more recent studies in veterinary medicine that are great. The group that's sponsoring us today, Assisi Animal Health, has got some randomized placebo-controlled studies. So they're really making an effort to produce good science that shows us that this sort of therapy is of benefit. The nice thing about it, it can be done at home. It's outpatient. It's drug-free, non-invasive. There's really no known adverse effects to targeted pulse uh, electromagnetic field therapies. And you can use it in combination with any of the other things we talked about, NSAIDs, omega-3 fatty acids, duralactin, and so on. Um, Assisi's come out with a couple of things. They've got this interesting loop that comes in different sizes for small applications and larger applications. You can see we can target the area here, either the wrist or the elbow on a dog like this, a big breed dog with a smaller loop. We can use bigger loops over bigger areas like the hips of this cat. And again, anywhere within that field that you saw on the last slide, is going to be treated adjacent to both sides of that loop. Uh, you can also use these loop assist devices where the patient can wear a little uh, top coat, if you will, that this uh, for active patients that maybe won't sit still like these guys that can be moved around the body. And really interesting for cats, I find this to be very intriguing and I've heard great things about the loop lounge where you actually can put two loops in a padding in the bottom of a carrier or a bed where a cat would frequent or a small dog, and this can then be done while they're resting, they can undergo the loop uh, pulse electromagnetic therapy. So very interesting things that again, don't harm the body in an elderly patient. A Couple other modalities to think about, acupuncture. Again, acupuncture does not harm the kidneys or any other systems in an older body, yet it stimulates a very specific response in the areas it's given that hopefully provide deadening of pain for arthritic patients, as you see here in the stifle joint, down into the carpal, I'm sorry, in the tarsal joint. So acupuncture is something, I've had many, many patients as an internist over the years that have gone ahead and taken their pets uh, to acupuncturist in consultation with me as their internist. And I'm a definite believer that things like electromagnetic loop therapies and acupuncture produce a response that I can't produce with drug therapies. 
Cold laser therapy is another popular therapy in both humans and veterinary medicine uh, using uh, laser photons that are absorbed by the cells locally, as you see in this dog's wrist, that activates again cells to produce products that hopefully reduce inflammation and maybe help in regeneration of tissues. The trickiest part is getting these darn dogs and cats to wear these crazy glasses to shield their eyes from the laser. But this cat here looks like he's uh, having a pretty cool day. Uh, so again, another non-invasive type therapy that could be of help in arthritic patients. This is the one I get a ton of questions on, guys. Cannabinoids, CBD oil, what do we know? What we know is that these type of substances probably don't hurt unless you take way too much of them. Uh, but there's really no apparent harm that we've seen in using CBD oil in animals, but we have no real concrete studies yet that suggest to us what the effect is. Uh, certainly we have lots of anecdotal information from clients that feel their pets are better when they receive cannabinoids. People feel they're better when they receive them. But again, we've got a little bit of ways to go with some studies to see what we really think. But another, again, another option that definitely doesn't hurt the kidneys or the rest of the geriatric body. So finishing up, just a couple other things to think about that are, again, non-drug therapies, weight loss. A lot of our patients are overweight with arthritis. Consulting with your veterinarian to get a diet plan, a prescription for how many calories your pet should take a day. No more than 10% of those calories should come from treats. Elderly patients do require good amounts of protein and lower phosphorus intakes to help with their kidneys. Uh, when you look at all of these things, again, weight loss can be very beneficial. Taking your dogs out for increased walks once you've managed their pain. Cats playing with food puzzles or lasers in the house are all good things to encourage caloric burning. Just like in people, you've got to take in less calories and you've got to do more activity. But in this case, it's after you manage their pain. Um, for patients that really need additional help to strengthen muscles and supportive tissues, things like physical therapy, there's lots of veterinarian uh, offices and hospitals now offering water treadmills and other forms of physical therapy certainly are helpful in these patients to help strengthen arthritic limbs and even massage. You'll see this cat here really loves that. Uh, just simple things like giving, just like we feel better when someone massages that joint that's bothering us. You can see this cat has eaten this up. It's a good day to be that yellow cat. And then lastly, medical assist devices. You know, booties for better traction when you have dogs with arthritic limbs so they don't splay out or have problems like that. Assisting devices for helping lift dogs that up and down stairs that have weak rear limbs. Again, these are nice support braces that can be placed on any of the limbs of the body. They can also contain heat or ice packs that go in them. Using splints, uh, you know, their medical device splints to help limit range of motion. Uh, they're good oftentimes for the lower limbs like the carpus and the tarsal joints. All of these things, same things we would apply in people, are certainly good for arthritic animals. And again, they don't hurt. They're not drugs. They're not going to have any benefit. Or they're going to have benefits, but no real harm potential. Lastly, modifying the environment, guys. Probably this invisible staircase and cat food bowls up high on the wall are not a good idea if you're arthritic cats. We need easier access to food and water bowls for these patients, easier access to get in and out of litter boxes, maybe lower lips, better placement in the home. If your cat loves to be up in the furniture or your dog or in window sills, you know, help them get up to those areas. I'll give you a good example in my house. Finster, my older cat, definitely has arthritis. And he loves to get up again and drink out of sinks. He's got kidney issues as well. For him, what I find is, if I close the toilet lid, he uses that as an assist to jump to there and then to the sinks, where in the past it was always straight to the sink. Uh, heated beds are also very nice, again, especially for patients that live in cooler and colder climates. Uh, there's no doubt that, that heat helps arthritic joints loosen up and, and function better. Uh, so in summary today, you know, I want you guys to think about when you go to the veterinary office, you have a pet with arthritis, you wanna make sure that you have a discussion with your veterinarian to choose osteoarthritic drug therapies that both give you the desired effect, but also are cautious in older patients, especially if they have impairment of other organ functions, in my case, especially the kidneys. I want you to start with the lesser treatments. Try to start early chondroprotectants and then use treatments more consistently 
or combine treatments as things progress over time. Again, doing that, we can keep pain optional in these patients. Again, think about all these non-drug therapies, including like the pulse electron magnetic fields, acupuncture, things that will provide clinical relief to your dogs and cats, but will not have adverse effects. There's no drug effect. There's no effect on other organs in the body. And lastly, if you're, if you're a cat lover and have cats around the house, be careful because polypharmacy in cats oftentimes is, is associated with a worse outcome if you have to keep jamming things uh, down their throats. But uh, these non-drug therapy modalities are oftentimes handled very, very well by cats. So I want to thank you guys for spending the last uh, 25 minutes with me. Especially want to thank Nicole Westfall and Julie Pran from Assisi Animal Health. And I uh, hope that you found today's presentation a good time to have lunch and learn a couple of things.